We're in Daniel. We're going verse by verse through the book of Daniel. And today we're in chapter 11, which is a very complicated battleground full of war and bloodshed. So I thought we'd just show the movie Gladiator. <laughs> and then we go home. <laughs> Not really. Let's pray. Lord, uh, bless this time in your word. May we be strengthened by it, encouraged by it, and challenged to be who you've called us to be and to say what you've called us to say. And Lord, to do those things that are on your heart for our lives individually and as a church. We would pray that you speak to us through your word today. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Grab a seat if you would. So in Daniel chapter 11, uh, Bible scholars have done the math, and in this chapter alone, we have 135 fulfilled prophecies, which is an amazing scenario. God reveals what is to happen in the nation of Israel after the time of Daniel, and Daniel records it before it happens. So he's recording prophecy beyond his own history, beyond his own life. But for us, verses 1 through 35, and that's the verses that we'll focus on today, are past history. Verses 36 through 45, which we'll look at next week, describes the future for you and I. And I think it, it's been said, I think I said this last time, and it bears repeating, the prophecies in the Bible, especially here with Daniel, demonstrate the divine authorship of Scripture, God's infallible Word. In Isaiah chapter 46, 9 and 10, we have this, Remember the former things of old, for I am God, and there's no other. I am God, there's none like me. Declaring the end from the beginning, his prophecy from ancient times, things that are not yet done, saying, my counsel shall stand, and I will do all my pleasure. God says, I I'm going to share with you the future. Only I can do this. Over and over again, the Bible declares itself to be the word of God. As you read it, you hear things like, and the Lord said, or God said. In the King James Version, over 400 times you hear this phrase, thus saith the Lord. You might be sitting here and say, well, John, just because it claims to be the Word of God doesn't mean it is. I mean, I could write a book and I could conclude, thus says the Lord. So how, how do we know that this truly is God's Word, divinely inspired? Well, one way is prophecy. The fact that the Bible reveals future events before they happen. And in just these 35 verses, 135 fulfilled events alone. In 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 19, it says, And so we have the prophetic word confirmed, which you do well to heed as a light that shines in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts, knowing this first, that no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation. So Daniel writes the future. He tells those who are living in that time what lies ahead. And we can look back and see it, that it all has come to pass. Now, this section... Verses 1 through 35 of Daniel, chapter 11, covers a period of over 200 years. And I'm going to summarize a lot of the events, or we'll just get swallowed up by all the history, all, all the dates, all the events, and you'll just tune me out. You'll sit there like, oh, this is weird. <laughs> Come on. So, so I'm going to streamline it the best I can, 
and hopefully we'll be able to grasp the I think the center message of verses 1 through 35 you can get a good commentary or Bible encyclopedia and look up all the exact details and leaders and wars. But, but let's start with verse 1. Also in the first year of Darius the Mede, I, even I, stood up to confirm and strengthen him. Now, now here, here in verse 1, this is an angel speaking to Daniel, and there is this spiritual warfare that, that has been going on in the heavenlies, in the invisible realm. And this angel stood up for Darius in that realm to strengthen him as king in a battle that, that's going on spiritually. How, how many of you know that, that, that we, as nations... As countries, as states, as individuals, there is a spiritual battle that goes on in your life. There really is. I think you can really see it in our world today. You can see it in our country today. Amen. What's going on all around us in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12, it says, We do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers, against rulers, the darkness of this age against spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. There is this thing going on in the world today, whether you believe it or not, and in your life that has to do with spiritual wickedness and darkness and, and, and realms that want to control and have authority over certain areas of the world and over certain areas of people's lives. So this angel stands up and is strengthening and now I will tell you, he says, the truth, verse 2. Behold, three more kings will arise in Persia, and the fourth shall be far richer than them all. By his strength, through his riches, he shall stir up all against the realm of Greece. So, Daniel, there will be three more kings will arise over Persia, over that empire. And the fourth king will be far richer. And we know from history the name of these kings. And the fourth is one that's mentioned in the book of Esther. And it's a, it's a king by the name of Ahasuerus. If you want to turn to Esther uh, chapter 1, it, we, we get a little information about him. And it talks about his riches. Listen to what it says in Esther chapter 1, verse 1. Now, it came to pass in the days of Ahasuerus. This was who reigned over 127 provinces. 127 from, from India to Ethiopia. And then it says, In those days when King Ahasuerus sat on the throne of his kingdom, which was in Shushan, the citadel, in the third year of his reign, verse 3, he made a feast for all his officials and servants, the powers of Persia and Mede, the nobles and the princes and the provinces being before him, when he showed the riches of his glorious kingdom and the splendor of his excellent majesty for many days. In fact, 180 days in all. So he throws this huge party, this king that's mentioned there in Daniel chapter 11. And it takes him 180 days to show all his riches. How many days would it take you to show <laughs> all your riches? I think I could go online, pull up my bank account and go, <laughs> take about two minutes. 180 days. This guy ruling from India to Ethiopia, he's the one that's mentioned here in Daniel chapter 11, verse 2, and, and it says, Then a mighty king shall rise, verse 3, who shall rule with great dominion and do according to his will. Now, historically, Ahasuerus did invade Greece with an army of 2,641,000 men. 
and after eight months of war, returned home without a victory. He didn't win. Alexander the Great, in verse 3, the mighty king arises who shall rule with great dominion and do according to his will. He actually used the Persian invasion that came against Greece to rally the people to go to war seeking vengeance against the Persians. We've spoken of Alexander the Great before. We see him in chapter 2 in that, that, that statue. He, the bronze represented him. And in chapter 7, he's the leopard with great speed that goes across the world defeating. And he defeats the world and conquers the known world from Europe to India by the age of 32. Amazing accomplishment. In verse 4 it says, And when he has arisen, speaking of Alexander the Great, his kingdom shall be broken up, divided toward the four winds of heaven, but not among his posterity, nor according to his dominion with which he ruled, for his kingdom shall be uprooted even for others besides these. If you know the history of Alexander the Great, he dies around the age of, I think, 32. He dies of alcoholism and pneumonia after a big party. His kingdom is broken into four parts, as it mentions here, four regions, and it's four of his generals who take over. Now, he had an illegitimate son that could have taken his place, but he was murdered. He had a wife who was pregnant. She was murdered, and two of those regions that were taken over by these generals were Egypt and Syria, and they are talked about in this chapter from verse 5 all the way through verse 20. Now, now let me have your attention. The kingdom of Egypt and the kingdom of Syria geographically border Israel on the north and the south. So verses 5 to 20 describe a period of 200 years where Israel is literally caught in the middle of a battle between Syria and Egypt that goes back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And the armies of Israel and the nation of Israel, it's constantly involved and engulfed. It's kind of in the crosshairs, if you will, back and forth with these battles. One writer said, Daniel foresaw the turbulent years of Egypt and Syria struggling for supremacy and control over that region and over Israel. Verse 5 here in our, in our text. Also the king of the south, which would be Egypt, shall become strong as well as one of his princes, and he shall gain power over him and have dominion his dominion shall be a great dominion. He'll be strong and one of his princes. Now, it tells us in this chapter 11 of Daniel, and at the end of some years, they shall join forces, for the daughter of the king of the south shall go to the king of the north, Syria, to make an agreement but she will not retain the power of her authority, and neither his authority shall stand. But she shall be given up with those who brought her, and with him who begot her, and with him who strengthened her in those times. You go, what? Well, the king of Egypt gives his daughter, Bernice, to marry the king of Syria in an attempted political alliance and to gain power. But here's the problem. The king of Syria had a wife. And so he puts his wife away to marry Bernice. Well, Bernice wasn't happy. She poisoned her husband. She poisoned the king. She, she murdered her own husband. Then she murdered Bernice. And then she murdered the son of her husband and Bernice and made her son the new king. If, if you read through Daniel chapter 11, 
It's like housewives of Syria and Egypt. It's insane. <laughs> it's insane what goes on. And, and you can't make this stuff up. Now, when the news reached Egypt that Bernice had been killed and her husband, and her son, her brother, got the Egyptian army together and invaded Syria. This is verses 7 through 8. But a branch of her roots, that, that was her brother. One shall rise in his place, who shall come with an army, enter the fortress of the king of the north, and deal with them, it says, and prevail. And he shall also carry their gods captive to Egypt with their princes and their precious articles, silver, gold, and he shall continue more years than the king of the north. Also the king of the north shall come to the kingdom of the king of the south, but shall return to his own land. So north is Syria. They, they attack back and forth through Israel. And this, this warfare between these two nations is, is what this chapter is just full of. In verse 10, however, his son shall stir up strife and assemble a multitude of great forces. And one shall certainly come and overwhelm and pass through. Then he shall return to his fortress and stir up strife. And the king of the south shall be moved with rage Go out and fight with him, with the king of the north, who shall muster a great multitude, but the multitude shall be given into the hand of his enemy. And this is back and forth through the nation of Israel. When he has taken away the multitude, his heart will be lifted up. He'll be cast down tens of thousands, but he will not prevail. For the king of the north will return and muster up a multitude greater than the former and shall certainly come at the end of some years with a great army and much equipment. Again, this constant war back and forth between Syria, the north and the south, Egypt, Syria, going through Israel, caught in the middle, all historically recorded. And in verse 14, now in those times, many shall rise up against the king of the south. Violent men of your people shall exalt themselves in fulfillment of the vision, but they shall fall. So the king of the north shall come build a siege mound, take a fortified city, and the forces of the south shall not withstand him. Even his choice troops shall have no strength to resist. But he who comes against him shall do according to his own will, and no one shall stand against him. He shall stand in the glorious land, which is Israel, with destruction in his power." So Israel, Egypt is standing in the middle with all its power and strength. And this, this goes on and on. This is over a 200-year span. And he also set his face to enter, verse 17, with the strength of his whole kingdom and upright ones with him. Thus he shall do and he shall give him the daughter of women to destroy it. But he shall not stand with him or before him. And this he shall turn his face to the coastlands and shall take many. But a ruler shall bring the reproach against them to an end. And with the reproach removed, he shall turn back on him. Now, then he shall turn his face toward the fortress of his own land, his own land. But he shall stumble, fall, and not be found. Now, here's the deal. The king of North Syria will give his daughter... This, this king at this time is Antiochus or Antius. There, there's several of them uh, in Syria. He he's, gives his daughter to marry Ptolemy, the fifth, who is the ruler of Egypt. And Antioch hoped his daughter would help him maintain control of Egypt. But she betrays her father. It says here in uh, verse 18, After this he shall turn his face to the coastlands, because when his daughter betrays him, he turns to the coastlands to, to try and sneak in and invade Egypt. In verse 19, 
Then he shall turn his face toward the fortress of his own land. He, he's removed, he's turned back, he's, he's not successful. And when he comes to the coastland, he's turned back by a rising empire, it says. They shall turn his face toward the fortress of his own land, stumble and fall and not be found. What happens is there's a new player on the scene that a rising empire called the Roman Empire that stops Antichius. This new group from the west expanding east are involved. They push him back. He plunders his own land. The people rise up against him, verse 19, murder him. And it says in verse 19, he'll turn his face toward the fortress of his own land, stumble and fall, and not be found. His body was, was never discovered. Now, Daniel writes all this hundreds of years before it occurs, and it's very detailed. Now, the son of this Antichius, the third, after his father's death, now he rises to power. And he goes to Israel to get money, and he tries to tax Israel. And, and, and he learns this tax thing from the Romans. How many of you know that the Romans were masters at taxation? You read all about them taxing all the time. And I was reading a commentary about the way they did their taxes and how efficient it was. And the writer said this, but compared to America, they're fools. <laughs> I thought, boy, he's got that right. Gee, we're not going to go there. Okay. There shall rise in his place one who imposes taxes on the glorious kingdom. So, so this Antichius Epiphanes is his name. He's going to tax Israel to gain more income. And it tells us in, in verse 20, uh, but within a few days he shall be destroyed, but not in anger or in battle. See, he, he, his own brother, actually his own brother is Antichius Epiphanes. There was the Antichius and Antichius, and this brother that takes him out is Antichius Epiphanes, and he's the subject of verses 21 through 35. And you can't make this stuff up. It's just all this intrigue and all these leaders taking each other out for power and for strength. And so verse 5 through verse 20 is a period of 150 to 200 years of war between Syria and Egypt with Israel caught in the middle. Israel's being dominated back and forth by these two kingdoms. And in verse 20, things slow down and the pace focuses on this one ruler, Antichius Epiphanes, who is known, if you know anything about uh, Old Testament leaders and scripture, Antichius Epiphanes known as the Antichrist of the Old Testament because he's such an evil, wicked ruler He's a type of picture of the future Antichrist who will rise to power just before the time of tribulation here on earth. So look at verse 21. And in this place shall rise a vile person, it says, to whom they will not give the honor of royalty because he had killed his own brother. It'd be like the prince took out the king. He wasn't in line for this, but he took it. He shall come in peacefully and seize the kingdom by intrigue. So that's what he does. With, with the force of the flood, they shall be swept away from before him and be broken, and also the prince of the covenant. And after, verse 23, the league is made with him, he shall act deceitfully, for he shall come up and become strong with a small number of people. He shall enter peaceably even into the richest places of the province, and he shall do what his father have not done, nor his forefathers. He shall disperse among them the plunder, spoil, and riches. He shall devise his plan against the strongholds, but only for a time. He'll stir up his power, his courage against the king of the south with a great army, and the king of the south will be stirred up to battle with a very great and mighty army, but he shall not stand, for they shall devise plans against him. Yes, those who eat 
of the portion of his delicacies shall destroy him. His army shall be swept away, and many shall fall down slain. And in verse 27, both these kings' hearts shall be bent on evil, and they shall speak lies at the same table, but it shall not prosper, for the end will still be at the appointed time. Both Syria and Egypt, these two kings, enraged and engaged in war, come to the table, it says, for a peace treaty. But they're both lying. They're both deceitful. They both break the treaty. And imagine kings and rulers and presidents telling lies at a table. This is a historical fact. Antichius Epiphanes passing through Israel. It tells us in verse 28, returning to his land with great riches, his heart shall be moved against the holy covenant. He comes through Israel and he turns his heart against Israel. So he shall do damage and return to his own land. He's heading back to Egypt. He stops in Israel and it's incredible what happens. At the appointed time, he, well, he shall return to go toward the south, but it shall not be like the former or the latter, for the ships from Cyprus shall come against him. These are the Romans. Therefore, he shall be grieved. He's turned back and enraged against the holy covenant. He goes, he can't capture Egypt. He can't get where he wants to go. So what he does, he goes back to Israel in a rage against the Holy Covenant to do damage. And so he shall return and show regard for those who forsake the Holy Covenant. And forces shall be mustered by him, and they shall defile the sanctuary. They shall take away daily sacrifices and place there the abomination of desolation. Now, now let me have your attention. Here's what happens. He goes to invade Egypt. He's Turn back again, the ships of Cyprus, the Romans. So, so he turns back and instead attacks Jerusalem. Slaughters over 80,000 Jews. Makes slaves over another 80,000 plus, And forces them to stop their temple worship. Forces them to stop the temple sacrifices. Forces them to erect an idol of Zeus in the temple. He slaughters a pig on the altar, which is the abomination of desolation. And there are many of the Jews who just lay down. He outlaws circumcision, which is the covenant sign between God and Abraham. He, he says, that's no longer going to be a covenant for you. And so he would kill children who had been circumcised. He, he would kill those who be, continued to practice it. All his wrath and anger is, is turned toward Israel. And look at verse 30. It says, he returns in rage against the holy covenant and, and, and do damage. And he shall return and show regard for those who forsake the holy covenant. So here's what happens. When he comes back in and he's got this army and he's slaughtering people, there are many Jews that said, hey, you don't want me to do sacrifices? You don't want me to worship? You don't want me to do circumcision? Okay, I'm good with it. And they just sort of cave in. They, they forsake their faith. And all his wrath and anger, this, this king, is, is turned on Israel. And he's seen, once again, as the Antichrist of the Old Testament. But there's an interesting passage here as we continue to read. And forces, verse 31, shall be mustered by him, and they shall defile the sanctuary. They shall take away sacrifices, place there the abomination of the desolation, the slaughter of the pig, the, the statue of Zeus. Those who do wickedly against the covenant, he shall corrupt with flattery. But the people who know their God, it says, shall be strong and carry out great exploits. And those are the people who understand shall instruct many, yet for many days they shall fall by the sword and flame by captivity and plundering. Now when they fall, they shall be aided with a little help, but many will join by intrigue. 
And some of those understandings shall fall to refine them, purify them, make them white until the time of the end, because it is still for the appointed time. Some just fold and go along, turn from their faith, stop their sacrifices, their circumcision, their, their dietary laws. Their, they, they even would burn scripture. If they found anyone who had a scroll or any kind of scripture, they would burn it or they'd force them to burn it. They didn't want them reading the scripture anymore. But there was a group who stood up. It says in verse 32, but the people who know their God shall be strong and carry out great exploits. This was known in history as the Maccabean Revolt. There was a group within that time when Antichius Epiphanes turned from Egypt, came back through, and, and really began to, to just go off on, on Israel. They took a stand for God. And eventually, they defeated Antichius Epiphanes. They cleansed the temple. They rededicated it, started the sacrifices. Th this is where, if you know anything about Jewish history, this is where the celebration of Hanukkah comes from. This is where the, the, the rededication and the, the feast of dedication comes from. A small group took a stand for God and did not bow down to the evil leaders of the Syrian government. In fact, it says in verse 32, and I want to read it again because I love this passage, but the people who know their God shall be strong and carry out great exploits. Now, th this verse kind of jumps off the page amidst all the slaughtering and the wars and people who are bowing down to what's going all around them. And that's what happened. They took a stand. They fled into the desert, this small group of guerrilla warfare, and they stood up because here's why. They knew who God was. Isn't that amazing? And, and I would submit to you in a... In a changing culture that we live in where people intimidate you about your beliefs and about your practices. God was the one who called them apart. So, so I, I ask you this question this morning. Who has God called you to be? What's he called you to do? What's he called you to say in this crazy, weird culture that we live in? I, know, I have no idea where we are at the end time timeline, but I think you would agree with me that times are crazy, Amen. that life is weird. Right now, as we sit here, Israel once again is caught, a, caught between enemies on all sides. You, you, you've got you know, the Hezbollah, the Hamas, you, you've got Syria, you've got... Uh, Iran, you've got all these wars coming back and forth. And, and, and we live in a time when the, our culture is, is very confused about this. You've got marches for Palestinians. You've got those who are pro-Israel. Anybody watching the news at all about these things? <laughs> Isn't it crazy? It's bizarre. And then we live in a culture that is constantly, and maybe this isn't the greatest thing to say during this time frame, but I feel like I probably should say it. All these voices of intimidation and, and, and telling you and me uh, not to speak up, not to say this, and all the voices that are shouting so loud publicly in all these different arenas, things like, hey, same-sex marriage is okay. It is? When did that happen? <laughs> oh, oh, sex without marriage is okay. It is? When did that happen? Don't you say anything, you hater. <laughs> you know, in our generation right now, and you can choose your own gender. It's okay. It is? When did that happen? I always thought it said back here in Genesis, God created man and woman. Where did this other group come from? You can legalize drugs. It's okay. Why wasn't that? When I was a teenager, why didn't that happen? <laughs> no, no prayer in school. 
that's okay. A lot of pressure to be silent about your faith, to compromise your faith, to give up your faith. L listen to this, this verse one more time. I just want to read it. But the people who know their God shall be what? Strong. How are they strong? They know their God. They're not playing church. They're not just, you know, do, doing a social thing. They, they know their God, and they know what's going on in their nation is wrong. Amen. And that they've come not just against them, but they've come against God. And so God takes this small group of people, empowers them to do amazing things, and they defeat Antichius Epiphanes and restore the sacrifices and restore what God had placed there in their midst. I was going to quote this little hymn for you. I love it. It's very old. You've heard it a million times if you've grown up in church or even if you haven't. It says this. It says, I've decided to follow Jesus. I've decided to follow Jesus. I've decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back. Though none go with me, I'll still follow Though, though none go with me, I'll still follow. Though none go with me, I still will follow. No turning back. No turning back. That was these guys. All across the world, leadership systems are shaking and crumbling. Government's in trouble. Credibility is broken in pieces. Economy is debt-ridden. Entertainment is in the gutter. Multiple wars. Crime is out of control. Addiction. Our own presidential election, I'm sorry to say, if you travel outside our country, it's a joke to people in other countries. I was in Ireland last year, and someone came up to me, and, and, and we are talking politics, and he goes, don't you have an age limit on your uh, elections? <laughs> I, <laughs> no. <laughs> you remember the story? There's a story, and, and, and I'll, I'll finish here soon, uh, about a young disciple named Andrew. Jesus had a large group of people gathered, and it started getting late, and uh, Disciples want to send the people away. Just send them away, Lord. We can't feed this many people. And Andrew uh, came to, to Jesus with uh, a young boy's lunch. It was five loaves of little bread and two little fish. And if you, if you remember the story, I think I have it right. Jesus took the small amount given. He, he thanked his father. And he fed all of them with it. Disciples gave it all, Jesus took it all, and God blessed it all. And, and you might be here today and you think, you know, I don't have much. It wouldn't take me 180 days to share my riches with anyone. I, I don't have that much to give. Or I don't, I don't have a, you know, a nation, or I'm not over the Persian Empire. Well, you have neighbors, you have friends, some, some of you have some friends, <laughs> have family, you have co-workers, you, you have your influence, you have your world, a multitude, so to speak, that God has placed in front of you. So, so I would challenge you with this passage of scripture, know your God, be unashamed of him. And be strong. And give him your time. Give him your personality. Give him your love. Give him your resources. Give him all that you have. That's the call. Know your God and, and be strong. I mean, I mean, here's Daniel prophesying of the future. When, when Israel will be in dire situation where this 
ruler of intrigue and deception will come in and, and just destroy everything that the Israelis had set up in obedience to God. And some people will just walk away from it immediately. Say, oh, well, if this means I get to live here and still prosper, then I'm okay. But there will be those, it says, who know their God and will do great exploits. Do you know your God? Do you know what he's called you to do? What he's called you to say? What he's called you to be? And it's not just to be a passive person who lays down in an ever-increasing, changing culture. It's a believer who, who he's, he's, he's called, who's given you his spirit, his word. He, he's equipped you with a lot more than a couple of loaves and fishes. And you say, Lord, okay, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll give that to you. And then you tell me what to do. And if you really mean that, if you really ask him that, be careful because he'll give you something to do. You know, I, I, that happened to me at 18 years of age. I was a high school dropout, uh, super shy. Uh, I could tell you my testimony, but if I said, okay, God, if you really want me, he said, yeah, I, I, I can use a guy like you, I think. And um, I'm still trying to know this God and I have an influence for him. And I would love to challenge you today to know your God because to know him is to be strong and carry out great things for him. You say, well, what do I do? Where do I start? I'm glad you asked. That's one of the ch children's leaders, here's the great place to start, handed me this this morning. He said, could you announce this? Because in the summer, our volunteers drop way down helping kids. I go, they do? Not, not our people. So, oh, yeah, our people. So on the back of this, it's in front of you, and you're, it's not your desk like Rob said. It's your chair. <laughs> no dispersion on, on Rob. But here, here's what it has. This would be a, just a simple place to start. Uh, serve on Sundays. Like you could pick one Sunday out of the whole summer. Could you do that? Oh, John, those kids are terrors in there. They tower me from limb to limb. <laughs> Be strong. <laughs> know your God. <laughs> anyway, they, they, they're looking for help at VBS, Windshape, Serve on Sundays. If just a small group here said, yeah, I can do that, it would be an amazing thing for our children's ministry. And, and to give regularly. You know, we're trying to build a school. We, we, we're trying to take care of our staff. And, and even though our church has grown a lot, I say this not out of any kind of meanness. Or, our income's not growing. It's like, are these people not giving? <laughs> Be strong. Know your God. He blesses those who give. Now, that's one thing my wife and I started when we first got married. So I said, Lynn, we'll always tie 10%. She goes, oh, yeah, we'll always do that. And even when we started the church, we didn't have any money. We had no insurance. And God has, God has blessed us. I don't have 180 days to share all my riches. It wouldn't take that. But I'm rich in so many other ways, so many ways. And a lot of that comes just being faithful to the Lord. He said, John, you've gone from teaching Daniel to meddling in all of our lives now. <laughs> this is my challenge. Be strong. And the only way you're strong and the way you live your life is to know your God. 